Hey everybody, this is Carlos. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with Brad Sherman of Brad Sherman Reptiles. Known for his top-notch customer service, Brad is one of the nicest guys in the entire boa industry. We're going to talk about how he got involved in the boa game and his plans for the upcoming season. We're also going to talk about his experience raising rodents in order to support your collection. And then finally, we're going to talk about the Celtic gene and its potential. Boa Rack Radio is on the air now. Welcome everybody to Boa Rack Radio. I'm your host, Carlos Rojas of Morphs Unleashed. And with me is my co-host, Chaz of Loki Boas. Chaz, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up, Carlos? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, dude. Glad to have you back on, man. It's been a little bit of a while since we did one of these. Had uh, had my whole hunting season going through and uh, needed to basically load up on meat, uh, you know, for the family for the whole year. It has been, man. It's been a while, but uh, at least I think your hunts went well, and uh, I'm happy to be back, man. Happy to talk some boas. Yeah, most definitely, man. So I'm pretty excited to talk about our guest today, probably one of our best friends in the industry, one of the nicest guys that you're ever going to do business with out here, and just a good guy to you know BS with in general. So that is going to be Brad Sherman, right? So Brad's a local breeder here out of Arizona, and he has really come to be known for his like outstanding customer service record and the fact that he's got one of the sneakiest and best boa collections kind of on the West Coast. Um, Brad is definitely... One of our favorite people in the industry, uh, Brad. Welcome to the show, dude. Hey, Carlos. How you guys doing? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Glad to have you on, dude. So, um, you know, for those people that don't know you, give us a little bit of background about how you got involved with boas and how that all came around. Man, so so yeah, I've really had a lifelong passion for for reptiles essentially from day one. You know. Um, I was probably about two or three years old. Uh, my parents got me my first uh, quote-unquote exotic animal, uh, box turtles. <laughs> got to start summer, you know. Um, so yeah. they bought my brother and each one of those, you know. We kind of did that for a little while. Um, the funny thing is, to this day, I, I still have that box turtle. Uh, she resides out of my parents' place in a nice outdoor enclosure. So she's uh, she's going on, I think, 35 years old or so. She's uh, she's getting up there. but uh, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty old box turtle, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, she's happy out there. She lives out there year round. You know, she'll she'll hibernate in the winter. She'll dig down. So you know, it, she's really working out well out there. So nice. Man. Yeah, fast forward a few years. Uh, my, my brother's box turtle escaped, so uh, we had to look for a replacement. <laughs> so uh, at that time, we we're perusing the, the newspaper classifieds. Uh, we came across an ad: some guy selling uh, Russian box turtles. So uh, he was out in Glendale. We went out there, checked him out. Um, while we're out there, he's kind of showing us around the rest of his collection. Um, he had this huge outdoor enclosure with these huge, impressive uh, green iguanas, you know, just incredible animals, you know. And he's like, yeah, hey, um, I got some eggs that are due to hatch in a couple of weeks. Uh, Y'all should come back and, you know, pick some up. So uh, as you expect from there on out, I, uh, I never let my mom live it down, basically. I was just nagging her and nagging her until eventually she allowed us to get some iguanas. So, so yeah, we did the iguana thing for a few few years um you know that was a lot of fun um but my mom was always against us having snakes you know that's where she drew right. the line um but one day we're, we're in a pet shop in glendale i think we're in there getting turtle food or maybe something for the iguanas uh and i saw this really killer looking lavender albino california king snake um and and again you know i i you know i just nagged her nagged my parents so eventually they allowed us to get that animal you know um, I remember first time holding that thing, you know, it was musking all over me and stuff like that, but I, I didn't care. <laughs> it was just such a cool animal, you know. So, but yeah, that's basically where it all started with the colubrids. Um, so back at that time, you know, albino ball pythons were still like $7,500. So, right, you know, if you right. wanted to get in the morphs, you, you had to start with the colubrids. So, um, started with that one, you know, within a matter of months, I'm adding other Cal Kings. You know, got some high whites, 50-50s. Um, and shortly after that, you know, I got my first boa got some bald pythons i was in the rosy boas for a while you know as a kid as well um and yeah that's where it all started it just kind of snowballed from there nice man so what kind of made your collection go from a hobby collection to a breeding collection um was there any particular event or is that something that kind of gradually happened over time so yeah i, I still consider myself more of a hobbyist still you know i'm not really looking to pursue this as like a full-time business but uh, it probably just because the variety of combinations and, uh, 
you know, that I eventually want to make. There's so many cool projects out there. I really can't just narrow it down and focus on one project. So, you know, that's kind of the, the result of so many, so many projects out there. I just want to pursue all of them. I can't really focus on just one or two. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you, uh, as you've gotten, you know, more involved kind of with the BOA game, are there any, body, any folks that kind of have mentored you along the way or people you looked up to and try to learn from? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. So, um, you know, Chaz has been an incredible mentor for me along the way um, from day one. You know, he'd invite me over to his place, show me around the snake room. I remember one of the first times I went over there, you know, he pulled out like four or five different Key West boas and he kind of broke it down and showed me, you know, how to identify the different combinations. Yeah, this is a single one gene Key West. Here's a hypo Key West, hypo jungle Key West. And, you know, these are really identifying markers. This is kind of how you distinguish the two, you know. You know, he's poured a, you know, a wealth of knowledge into myself, and uh, yeah, I, I can't thank him, thank him enough for that. Yeah, I think we met in 2000, 2015, right? 2014, Brad? Yep, yep, 2015. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd had a litter of like hypo jungle Key West Aztecs, and uh, it was a funny thing because it was a big litter, and um, yeah, me and Brad were starting to become friends, and I wanted to hook him up, so I had this like really nice Key West. It's right. like, man, this is like the nicest Key West like I've ever made. Like I've never really seen one like this. And I was like, Brad wanted to get in, and so I was like, yeah, man, hooked him up with one, good price. And then as I started like making more ba babies and kind of raising them up, I think I think it was you that texted me, Brad. You're like, I think this is like a jungle Key West. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like why it was so vibrant, yeah, yeah. why the tail was so like just outstanding example of the animal. And then you know at that time still I think it was really only Jeff Ronnie that had made you know, really nice jungle um, Key West. And uh, right. you just, there was a few pictures of online from articles he had posted, but um, you know, you just hadn't seen that many of them. So I ended up selling them for like a pretty good price, a really nice jungle Key West. And uh, I think we've, we, we've been great friends ever since then, man. Yeah, yeah no yeah, man, absolutely. Brad's, Brad's one of the nicest guys, like I said, kind of in the whole industry. Cause I met him, you know, kind of shortly after that, dude. The mm -hmm. thing about Brad is, like, once you get to know him, and, like, th this is kind of the same whether you're a customer that you just met him or somebody that's been doing business with him a long time, man. Like, you feel like you've been boys with the guy for years. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. he's just very genuine, real yeah. real genuine, and um, wants to do right by you. And he just genuinely, like you said, he likes the animals. Like, a lot of people have illusions or delusions of making a ton of money or being, like, financially driven. But, uh, yeah, Brad just loves the animals. Um, and that, that was that was my favorite thing that driven him about him. Like we we've, we've been friends all these years and talk a lot because we just genuinely like the animals, um, and and that's where our focus lies. So yeah, hundred percent, man. So Brad, what are you working on right now, man? What's kind of uh, some of the projects that have caught your eye and that you're kind of moving with? Oh man, where to start? Where to start? Um, so yeah, there, there's a few letters that uh, I made this year. I'm pretty excited about. Um, we, I made some uh, cool jungle red dragons. Um, some of the some of the blood uh, jungle bloods from that litter just came out. You know, incredible. The red dragons, nice. Um, I made a nice uh, orange asm uh, VPI snow Girl Key West litter. Uh, pretty excited about that stuff. You know, it's incredibly colorful. And uh, also the Celtic jungle sunglows uh, made a litter of those. Um, I know not a lot has been done with those yet in the U.S. So pretty excited how those came out the color colors just you know out of this world they just keep getting better you know every single day yeah no dude uh how about uh, ball python wise because i know you're into balls also yeah yeah i'm still doing a few uh ball python projects uh recently i made a champagne fire clown so i'm trying to do quite a few things with a champagne clown project um you know that, that thing pr came out pretty nice um amazing trying to make man. some yeah it's not too bad um try to make some fire batmans too so some clown projects pied projects stuff like that but uh you know i've, I've really trimmed my ball python collection maybe like 20 adults or so now but uh okay. just kind of narrow down the, the projects i really want to focus on yeah dude, dude that's i was completely understandable dude i was super blown away when he sent me the picture when he hatched that um the champagne fire clown because like yeah up until this point i feel like it's pretty much that project was given up on and then i saw it and he was able to get the the, the pattern back on there it was amazing i think i think that, that that snake alone that he made will generate a ton of interest and i know he got like a shout out from justin kabalka and a few other people like big python, big big breeder python ball python people like i think took notice of that because you know it's it's hard nowadays to make ball pythons that that 
that are um, really grab people's attention, and uh, yeah. that yeah. that was I one. Of, that's a huge accomplishment. I, I put a lot of years in that. I made my own hats, you know, back in 2017. That female seemed like she didn't want to produce for me for you know time after time, but eventually I, I had a small shot of her. You know, only three eggs, but uh, you know, luckily I hit the odds. But uh, yeah. yeah, man. Well, if anything else, uh, like. I think that serves as a really good lesson because there's a lot of genes that people, even in the bow industry, that people have kind of overlooked or given up on, right? And the reality is you just simply don't know what the interaction is going to be until you try it, right? And it's kind of the same thing with, like, the champagne. I know a champagne kind of before the, like, ball python-wise, before, like, the banana market, you know, dropped out, the champagne was kind of like the hot gene, right? Mm. And yeah. as people were mixing it with different things, everybody was getting really excited. And then they kind of found out that it ate up pattern. Yeah. And it seems like everybody just kind of gave up on that, you know? Right. But, yeah, but you know, what we found is the fire really brings all that pattern back. Exactly. Yeah. This is probably one of the most heavily patterned animals you'll see, you know. So, you know, and, and JKR has proved that there's, there's tons of other genes that bring that pattern back as well. So, you know, the Champagne Clown Project definitely has a bright future. Oh yeah, no, hundred percent, man. Well, uh, one of the main reasons why me and Brad um, get along so well and why we're such good friends is that, like, I kind of, I kind of tend to think out of the box, and sometimes I might go off on tangents myself. But as far as like projects, me and him both kind of try to focus, like, I guess, on like stuff that maybe people have written off a little bit, because um, I started like looking at the ball python world specifically, and like people like Justin Kabalka, like how how did they attain success? And they they've done it a lot through projects that were kind of written off by right. maybe mixing ingredients that people hadn't done before and taking these relatively cheap morphs that people had given up on and combining them, just combining them and kind of tinkering around. So that's what me and Brad are always talking about. Like, hey, what do you think about this? Like the Key West is, I still feel like is, is, is doesn't get its due respect. And then you have like genes like the Celtic. So, um, you know, with me and Brad, we're always like, well, let's try this. And he's always supported me and we kind of do it together. And, um, you know, we're still, it's still an uphill battle. Um, he still made some great stuff, and I don't know if people really realize it, but um, that's, me and him are constantly talking about, like, how can we get, bring the Celtic to light? How can we bring, you know, these other little genes to light that, 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 that can make great snakes and can, can add a lot to other combos that are already out there, but for whatever reason, people just are kind of uh, hesitant to do it. Yeah, no, I'm with you, man. I mean, like, I think one of the nicest boas that I own just flat out is actually a het that I got from Brad, which is uh, this uh, this Chunkun pastel uh -huh. that uh, I ended up picking up from a couple of years ago. This thing turned out to be ridiculously bright, and you know, kind of what you're saying, it's a pastel line that a lot of people have written off and maybe yeah. don't really mess with a lot. And speaking of pastel lines, Brad, I know you posted a couple of days a uh, pastel that you had out there, or I'm sorry, a hypo you got out there that was redder than most bloods. So talk a little yeah. bit about that one. Yeah, so that's actually from the Summit Pastel bloodline. Yeah. Um, we oh. bred a Summit Pastel, actually a double dose Summit Pastel, uh, super hypo jungle male. We bred to a super red high-tech female. Right. And uh, yeah, she's a Summit Pastel, super high-tech jungle. Um, well, not proven super yet, but, uh, but yeah, those animals just get incredibly colorful with age. Um, they're, they're already redder than uh, any of my bloods. And uh, that animal's three and a half years old, and uh, she just keeps getting better every day. So um, th there's a ton of potential in the pastel lines. People are sleeping on all sorts of them. Um, so let me ask you, kind of in terms of that animal, do you think that what's making that particular animal so damn red is the double dose, or do you think there's something potentially else going on that maybe we haven't identified yet? I would say it's just the, the combination of the two pastel lines uh, between the parents. Um, yeah. Since the, the female wasn't from the Summit pastel line, but she, she was um, the Summit past up they're notorious for making some some really red animals right. i just think it was the, the right combination of pastel lines to, to make that that certain animal any other animals that you're pretty stoked about that maybe aren't necessarily breeding um that you're currently working with hell yeah you so I kinda did a little bit of a, go ahead well well we got quite a few to get to but uh th there's one pairing i did this year was kind of outside of the box um i, I bred a red rum posset vpi male to a, a super dark uh, arabesque motley female Hmm. Uh, typically, like with the red rounds, people want to stick with the VPI or the lighter morphs. You know, I thought it would be interesting if you kind of plug it into a, a darker animal. You know, right. she's, she looks like an IMG. She's almost completely black. So these animals came out pretty interesting. I actually 
was hoping, I was looking more forward to the Red Rim Motleys, that outlet, or, but it turns out the Red Rim Arabs are just, they're out of this world. They're the, like, really? reddish, pinkest animals, and just, they just keep getting yeah. so much better with age. They're the reddest they're six Arabs. Months now, but. They're the reddest Arabs I've ever seen. And I felt like, I always felt like Arabesques were very colorful and orange and almost golden, so they had, like, a real unique color, but when he added them with that red rump, they're, they're, they're hands down the reddest Arabs I've ever seen. Like, just right. single gene. You can't capture what they look yeah. like in person. Um, the, the black is, like, super black, so it has good contrast between the black patterning, you know, the red, the red undertones. Yeah, you know what? Um, I've, I've gotten a couple of Arabs from Jeremy Solis, right? And, like, mm -hmm. kind of same thing. Super, super dark animals, dude. And I've been kind of wondering what that, you know, what that interaction would be. Um, so as you're bringing this, are you thinking of adding anything that could make it potentially red or, like, blood or anything like that? Kind of what are your thoughts with so, this thing? So I'm looking at plugging that red rum line back into this that Summit Pastel High Tech Jungle Girl. Huh. So we're going to, you know, merge the red rum and the Summit Pastel lines and ultimately to, you know, eventually produce an even redder animal. Oh, that's awesome, dude. That's fantastic. Now, I know you're also kind of working with uh, labbies a lot, so talk a little bit about, what, you know, what you're currently doing with, with your lab project. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, talk about my lab rooms. That, that gets me excited, man. Um, Chaz, do we, do we want to spill the beans on the, one of the pairings we have lined up this year? Yeah, you can tell. I don't, I don't care. So, so... We have a uh, adult female pastel monster tail hypo labyrinth female. We're gonna plug into a visual specter male to, to hopefully make some uh, double hats, some labby double hat specters. Because uh, yeah. eventually, I th think uh, you know an RDR lab or even a, a specter lab. That's just gonna be the, the most incredible animal like I can possibly think of. So yeah, or an RDR crystal. That. That's oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yep. You know so that, that labyrinth pattern really does you know adapt well with annery lines some of the oh yeah few annery labs that we've seen out there dude are you know really clean i've been i've been really interested in seeing some of the work for example that kenny's doing to see kind of how that arab line is going to be able to mix in with uh kenny's carbon line so oh yeah yeah i'm sure kenny's working on that plugging it into the carbons Oh so, yeah, hundred percent. speaking speaking of the annery labs um i was able to pick up a, a labyrinth head and from jeff this year yeah. So uh, we we uh, me and Chaz have some uh, powerhouse females uh, lined up for him in the coming years. Uh, we got an IMG Fire Hypo Jungle Motley Head Henry female. Yep. And then we got a Ghost Jungle Key West Aztec female Posset VPI that uh, we're going to plug him into over the next couple of years. Awesome. Man. So hey. definitely look forward to those. And one of the other lines that I know you're kind of working with just randomly is the Orange Gasm line, right? So. Talk a little bit about what you're doing with that line and, you know, some of the potential that you kind of see in that line itself. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm not really doing anything special outside the box with that line yet. You know, it's some of the same stuff, you know, Chaz has done. Uh, Frank Martin yep. is really working with that line. Uh, um, but they, they make the most incredibly colored uh, VPI snow glows. You know, they, they're super bright, super crisp. Super clean. Like yeah, lavender clean. color. They have these, the eyes just pop like, like crazy. So yeah, just making. Uh, I made some snow glow jungle Key West this year. Snow glow jungle. Um, we made some, you know, VPI Key West and things of that nature from that litter. You know, it, it's it's definitely an exciting pastel line to work with. Um, they're super hardy. They grow like crazy. So uh, yeah, I, I really like that line. Yeah, dude, that's absolutely true, man. Because I have a couple of Frank's animals, dude, and those things like never refuse to eat. They're just they're always on, man. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah those, on. those males will breed at 18 months just like clockwork every time. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah, no, they, they kick ass, man. As you've kind of come up through this hobby, and, like, you have kind of one of these sneaky boa collections, uh, very much kind of like Sergio, where people don't know unless they personally know you. So how have you been able to kind of raise up such a good collection? So I, I would owe a lot of that credit to Chaz. So kind of like I said earlier, from day one, he kind of took me under his wing. He he showed me all these morphs in person, you know. You you can look through morph market all day long, but without actually seeing these in person, it's it narrows it down on the point to work with. You, it kind of opens your eyes to the potential of all these genes. Right. So, yeah, I've kind of taken the path, you know, of a lot of the, the morphs that Chad's working with. You know, I have some other ones that he's not working with, but... uh. Yeah, just seeing all those in person, it, it really just, you know, lit a fire under me to kind of get into these and 
kind of start producing some of the animals he's producing. Definitely, man. I will say when, yeah, when under the circumstances that me and Brad had met was, was kind of like in 2015, um, I kind of ramped up a lot of my snake collection and um, it was just too time consuming and I was on Facebook a lot and um, it just, I just kind of got like a little bit burnt out. So I kind of, that's when I just took a step back from, from everything, from breeding my own rodents, from posting a lot of pictures on Facebook, because um, I just wasn't enjoying it as much anymore. But I still liked had a genuine passion just for the snakes. Like I've always loved boa constrictors. I always have boa constrictors. But uh, and that's when I met Brad. I was selling off all my ball pythons, and um, me and Brad had done some. Um, I think I'd sold him a couple, or we had some trades. And uh, I still wanted to just share in my passion. So I'd be like, Yeah, man, just come on over. Just come on over and check it out. So I wasn't like. I wasn't posting any pictures, but you know, it's nice to have a friend to like mutually share stuff with. So I just tell him to come over and just like share like all these cool litters that we made. So um, fortunately at that time, like I was selling a lot of animals and uh, Brad got a, a lot of my cool, some holdback stuff and some stuff at that time that I probably wouldn't have ever sold. And uh, it just kind of took off them from there because I can tell you honestly, I would have these animals that, you know, you have litters where you want to hold back everything, but you can't, you can't really do it. So I just kind of like, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to sell, sell it to someone that I don't know or, or, or um, you sell it at a discounted price that I can't really, uh, it'd be hard for me to live with myself that I don't really think is right? Or do I send it to a friend and let him work the project and pay me back later? And that's what I always like came back to was like, it, I don't really want to sell this, this, these animals or, or give this project away, but someone that also loves snakes as much as me and someone that I know will do right and also someone that I respect and I like as a person, as a human being, like I'd rather just hook him up all day as opposed to give these snakes away. So that's kind of what, how I've taken an approach. Kind of maybe like a pay it forward because I've also had people do this, do this with me. Um, like pay it forward. Like I want to see Brad be successful and now we've started to have, um, he's made great litters and um, it, it just well, it works out well for everyone because I genuinely feel like from what I've told him, like when he's successful, like I'm successful and it makes me happy. Like his success, I feel like is my success because we're friends and, and I care about him and, and I want to see him develop and make great snakes and better snakes than even what I can make and he's already doing it. So, so Brad, give me some lessons that you've learned uh, basically setting up your business and converting it from a hobby to a business. So a big thing I would say is just be patient, you know. Both the both take time to properly raise up the breeding size. You know, if you try to rush that, it, it's just going to come back to bite you, you know. Um, one of the important lessons I've learned of raising boas, you know, it's kind of gross, but you really want to look at their poop. Um, that's kind of the hmm. first sign of the animal's health, if there's anything wrong with the way they're digesting, digesting food, you know, if it's runny or light-colored. Right. You know, there's something that needs to be changed up, you know, within their feeding regimen, maybe their gut health is off. Um, that's something you want to look at, you know, no matter how gross it is. Um, another thing I've learned over the years, just, just be prepared for the unexpected, you know. Inevitably, the longer your breeding bow is in this hobby, the more likely you're going to experience some sort of heartache, you know, lose animals. Right. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize how common it is to lose animals during breeding season. You know, maybe a male overbreeding. A female having a you know having issues pushing out the babies, um, right. delivering stillborns. You know you just kind of had to mentally prepare yourself beforehand, beforehand, you know before diving headfirst into this hobby. Yeah. Now let me ask you, with that in mind, do you try to build in any redundancy into your collection for situations like that? Yeah, absolutely. As 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 far as uh, you know, the overall like the gut health of the boas. Like I, I look at that closely. If if they're starting to have stools that are runny or light colored. You know, especially you'll see it with babies sometimes. Um, we use some of that Nutribox, that power stuff. You'll go ahead yeah. and put on the, the rodents before you, you know, feed it to them. They'll kind of restore their gut health. Huh. You know, and uh, as far as losing animals during breeding, sometimes it, you can't avoid it, you know, with the females. But as far as the males, you really got to be careful not to overbreed them. You know, I separate my pairs weekly while I feed the rest of the animals, give them a, a one or two day break. Um, kind of just closely make sure they're not looking lethargic or kind of worn out if they are yeah. you know, it's time to call it quits for the year you know never try to breed a male to two females you know it just it's not going to end well yeah and i think one of the things that i know that i always look for just to make sure that i'm not overbreeding is i try to see their feeding response when i pull them out right makes me a little nervous too when i start to see that when they start to lose 
there's a tiny, a, a little bit of that body weight. I'm like, uh, yeah, and they don't want to eat. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a smart move, but it's hard sometimes. Sometimes you also have a female that's like, you know, is like starting to swell is like maybe a week or two from ovulating and you run into like the, the moral dilemma of like, what do you do? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fine line too, you know, sometimes if you get to the point of refusing, refusing food, it's almost too late sometimes. Yeah. So you, you just got to be careful, monitor the males closely and uh, yeah, just, yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like, you know, it really comes down to knowing your animals, right? And spending some time with the animals and really getting to understand, you know, how your animals normally behave, what the responses are normally. So I think, you know, that's really one of the main things that you always got to pay attention to. So Brad yeah, and yeah. Chaz, kind of both of you guys, talk to me a little bit where you guys see the future of the hobby going in the next couple of years. Go ahead, Brad. So... So I feel where we're at, you know, today in the bow world is, is kind of where the ball python world was maybe like 10 to 12 years ago. You know, we have a, a good amount of variety of like base morphs to work with, but there's still a, a ton to be done as far as mixing and matching those different combinations, you know. You know, there's still plenty of room in the hobby too for, for up and coming breeders just kind of themselves. Uh, there's just so much to be done. You know, it's, I think it's an exciting time to be in bows, you know, you can you can kind of make just kind of like an average combination that might be something that nobody else has ever made. You know, I made those, those Celtic Sungla jungles. Um, as far as I know, I haven't made those in the U S yet. So that, that's just, you know, a really simple combination. So, but, but the sky's the limit there. There's still so many cool combinations to be done. So I'm definitely excited. Personally, I just like the, like I've said before that the double and working our way towards triple and quadruple recesses, um, you know, blood leopards, blood gene, leopard gene, and the type one anery mixed with it. And then of course, like the RDR and the, the, the specter and the carbon stuff mixed into it, you know, snakes that double and triple recessives that are incredibly hard to make. And then, um, they're just outstanding. Like, like we've talked about before the habanero, like I love the habanero, but I also think like, what if that was a snow, like, what would that look like? Or, um, you know, the VPI bloods, what if that was a snow, the amatrines or whatever they're called. And I know that that's something that, Sergio's working on. I know it's something that probably a lot of people are, especially Thomas Cobb. Um, and I, that's why I like a lot of his snakes because I see where he's going and, and I see what he's trying to do. And um, that's where I think the future is. So snakes that are incredibly hard to make and, you know, we're, we're not, it's not as easy as the ball python world where we can do, turn around and do it in a year and a half or two years. But um, whether it takes 10 years, I firmly believe that, you know, when you start mixing a lot of these stuff that people were real hesitant to mix before with like leopards and VPIs and all this other stuff that, that the payoff will be huge. It just ta it just takes a long, long time. It takes 10 years sometimes to see some of these projects through. Just, uh, I think the future is bright. And then especially with the labyrinth gene, that's I think a lot of people's favorite gene just because the variety and, and the strength of it and, and um, the crystal, I think you just, you can't go wrong with any, any of those projects, man, any of those projects. So go ahead. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. that's as far as what I, yeah, think. I agree. Uh, the, the VPI snow leopards are going to be the, the most incredible animal. You know, it's something triple recessive. It's going to hold its value for, for a long time. And uh, as far as the labyrinths go, so eventually I, I see labyrinth being as common as jungle one day. People are just going to mix it into anything and everything. Yeah. And uh, I haven't seen a labyrinth combo I don't like. So, uh, yeah, it, you're going to see them all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a super jungle that's just one dose of, a codom, just a regular, a regular yeah. base, base gene. So it's, it's, um, it's really incredible. You know, like something like a snow leopard, if, if, and when people start to make those heads, if you really sit, sit and break down the numbers about the, the odds of actually trying to make a snake like that, like, I think I did it on morph, morph market calculator the other day. It was like one in, what was it, Brad? Like one in, it was well over a hundred, you know, like, snakes like that that are incredibly incredibly hard to make and then when you pay off and make it like the person that does the hard work in the beginning sets the foundation will be set to reap all the rewards because it'll take people five ten years to catch up unless you're willing to invest uh, in the beginning so yeah it's, it's sometimes it just pays off to buy the heads you know rather than making yeah. your own double triple quad heads it yeah it pays off it puts you ahead you know several years you know where you can just plug those heads together and make the visuals versus making your own yeah Sometimes it's, 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 yeah, you break down and bite the bullet and pay the money for it. It's hard. It's hard to buy heads. It's not, you know, it's not cool. It's not sexy. It's not like, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, not what fun. you want it. 
everybody wants to go out there and buy the, oh, I want to buy the VPI, IMG, Jungle Motley, you know, like, oh, I want to get, just buy the banger, but that's really not the way it always works out from my experience and the people that I know have long-term success. Um, they really, it's all about double and triple heads, and that's obviously what I've tried to do, like Tracy Barker making triple head VPI snows, um, and other people going down the line. You just have to, it, it takes time to make the really, really cool snakes, and then when you make them, everyone wants them, but obviously you have a little bit more control over things. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. Everyone has different, different avenues and different motivations and different dreams, but um, I would really, really love to see some of uh, like leopard VPI snows, blood VPI snows, intermixed with labyrinth, um, intermixed with, um, you know, other Kodam genes that I really like, like Celtic, Key West, Jungle. Um, so that's, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm heading. But, you know, honestly, like, uh, I'm glad that you guys said that, but this year I've had a pretty rough uh, breeding season. I had a lot of girls reabsorb, and probably one of the most uh, heartbreaking ones out of all that, out of those uh, reabsorptions, because yeah. I have a leopard uh, het VPI female that I paired up to a uh, orange gasm snow glow, and, uh, <laughs> oh, man. and it didn't take. I mean, she swole up. I thought everything was all golden, but just ended up reabsorbing, man. Right. It happens, man. Yeah. It happens. I mean, if you kind of feel like you get a year back, you, you, you can never get that year back. Oh, yeah. But at least you're heading in the right direction, man. You're heading in the right direction, and yeah. if they're healthy, you can take a shot at it again next year. Oh, yeah, totally, man. And at the end of the day, kind of like what you guys are mentioning, the only thing I really that, that I really do this hobby for is the fact that I want to see what these new interactions are going to be, right? And exactly. And that's kind of like briefly touching on like what Brad said earlier. Like he was... He found some genes that he felt were not being fully utilized with like the champagne ball python wise, right? And he decided to kind of pursue it with kind of a sole mission to see just what the interaction was going to be. And it paid yeah. off, right? Yeah. Awesome, guys. So we're going to take a break real quick, guys. And then when we come back, Brad, we're going to talk about raising rodents a little bit. All right, everybody, we're back. So one of the topics that we really wanted to cover today is uh, raising rodents. Now, for moderate to large snake breeders, some of the biggest challenges that we end up finding is really finding a reliable source of good quality feeders, okay? Breeding rodents, though, it's something that a lot of us have attempted in the past, but very few of us have been able to do really successfully. And because of that, a lot of people have kind of given up on it before they ever really got started on that front. So... Brad has been able to successfully raise, you know, a rodent breeding operation that was a, has been able to support his uh, boa collection pretty significantly. So, Brad, tell us a little bit about how um, you got started with rodents and maybe some of the misconceptions associated with breeding rodents. So, yeah, I, I've been breeding my own rodents for my, my animals since, since I was a kid. I was 13. I had around 20 or so snakes, and, uh, you know, it just seemed more, it seemed more cost-effective. And uh, it seemed easier to, to breed my own rodents back then since, uh, you know, I didn't have a vehicle to, to drive and get rodents. You know, I, wasn't, I didn't have a credit card. I couldn't order them, you know, online or whatnot. But uh, that, that's kind of why, you know, back then I, you know, I started breeding my own rodents. But uh, I, I would say the misconceptions nowadays is that you'll save a ton of money, you know, breeding your own rodents, which I'm not saying it can't be done. But, you know, if you're doing things right with, you know, feeding high-quality food, investing in quality caging, you know, you got to pay for electricity cooling, heating, ventilation, you know, it kind of adds up. Um, basically, and, I raise my and rodents. And your time. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, and yes. your time. Your exactly. time. Exactly. For sure. That's something that I don't think any, any snake people really factor into a lot of this stuff. Like, the, the time is probably your most valuable asset that you have. Right, absolutely, you know. So, yeah, in the end, I, pr I probably do save a few bucks, you know, um, breeding my own feeders versus just purchasing frozen, you know, online in bulk. But uh, ultimately, the reason I do it is to control the quality, the quality of the, the food that goes into the rodents, so I can control the quality that goes into my animals. You know, I, that peace of mind uh, is completely worth it for myself. Yeah, and I think, you know, the quality of your animals and the health of your animals is really demonstrated in the fact that you feed them such good quality rodents, right? So um, give us some pros to breeding your own feeders besides the quality is there any other reason you kind of do it or is it just so as you mentioned I, I, 
Yeah, as you mentioned, I think to maximize your success in breeding boas, you know, always having that perfect size, you know, rodent for each animal, you know, it's as fresh as possible. Um, you know, I might be a little biased, but I think I think the overall health of the animal kind of shows through, you know, feeding the higher quality rodents, you know. Uh, it's probably up for debate or not on whether, you know, a frozen rodent loses any of its nutritional value, but, right. you know, like I said, it's just worth it for my peace of mind. Now, is there uh, any particular, like, feeding regimen you have on the rodents that you feel, you know, really does make a difference with them? Uh, or do you kind of just feed Missouri? Like, what's kind of, how do you approach it? Yeah, so, so for the most part, I just do Missouri, you know, just keep up with that. I've had a lot of success, you know, especially with the mice. Some people have trouble uh, producing, you know, good quality of mice, and uh, they seem to do really well in Missouri. They have nice, clean coats, you know, they don't stink too bad, and, uh, yeah, I've had really good luck with Missouri. Nice. Um, do you ever supplement? Yeah. So, so what I found is, uh, so I have separate cages for uh, for grow ups, basically. You know, weaned animals that I'm eventually going to rotate into being breeders. And uh, I, I've been feeding those animals kind of like table scraps, vegetables, and whatnot. You know, the stuff we'd usually put in like a compost. Right. You know, fruits and vegetables, stuff like that. I'll, I'll feed those animals I'm going to raise up for breeders. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's helping out in the long run. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges associated with uh, breeding your own feeders. Ooh, so, so out here, you, you know, it, it's the elements. Um, our summers out here in Arizona, it's, it's 110 degrees for at least a three, four month span. It's probably over 100 for six months or more. So you, you got to have a well, you know, insulated and air conditioned area, you know, to have long term success breeding rodents. Um, another thing, you know, you probably want to have a good space that's, you know, not within your house, you know, they stink pretty bad. So you want to have a good ventilation system, right? some sort of good exhaust fan, maybe a charcoal air filter, you know, but uh, beyond that, yeah, it just, it's just the elements and, and, the, and the time, like Chaz said. Um, I probably spend three or four hours every Saturday morning out there cleaning. Um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges, just setting aside the time to, to proper, properly maintain everything. So let me ask you, why do you think so many people fail at breeding rodents or give up on it so easily? Do you th is there any kind of common theme that maybe you've noticed since you've been in the hobby and dealing with a lot of people? Because I know you, you sell your rodents every now and then. So kind of talk to me a little bit about why you think people are unsuccessful kind of going down this avenue. I would say some people don't realize how much work it is. It, it's yeah. hard work, you know, doing it on a larger scale and just... Some people think all oh, three, four hours is nothing, but doing it week in, week out, you know, you can't miss a week. If you miss yeah, a week cleaning, totally. you know, those animals are going to be filthy, you know. So, yeah, it, it's just the hard, the hard work, you know. You know, another, another tidbit to add in as far as, you know, maximizing success breeding rodents is uh, you got to be proactive in rotating out the breeders, you know. Once they're starting yeah. to get up there in age, you know, you got to phase them out, phase the new breeders. You know, every week I'm adding at least one or two cages of new breeders, and, you know. You know, doing that, you're just feeding a bunch of old rats, you know, for essentially for free. Yeah. And let me ask you, is there like a particular age that you um, usually phase them out, like with mice and with rats? You can kind of tell by looking at the rodent about their age and their kind of breeding span. So, yeah, yeah I have so many rodents, it's really hard to track the, the life lifespan. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, I kind of go off look. You know, any animals that may look sick, you know, I'll be euthanized. Yep. But uh, typically, as soon as they're showing any of that, the old age signs, you, you'll get them rotated out. So for the people that aren't familiar, kind of covers what some of those age, old age signs might be. Um, as, as far as the mice, they kind of walk a little bow-legged. Bow um, mm -hmm. They'll start losing some body weight. They'll start getting really skinny. Their tails will look skinnier. You know, okay. a healthy mouse has a, like a fatter, you can tell it's, you know, a more full tail, I would say. Um, yeah, I just say wasting away, losing weight. That, okay. That's one of the, the key in the key indicators. Okay. And, and I, with the female rats, um, when they start getting really big, you kind of just tell you know what age they are based off their size, and uh, the production slows way down at that point. Yeah. So, why don't you give uh, folks out there who are interested in you know breeding their own rodents maybe some tips about what they could do or maybe some lessons learned that you wish you knew when you first started doing this probably kind of what we talked about before you know you have to dedicate a lot of time for it you know so be prepared for that um, be prepared for you know some significant costs here or there um, some of my electric bills here in the summer are sky high just by the, the amount of electricity we're using out there um, 
and basically every summer I'm having to, to replace an air conditioner because all the ammonia in the air it gets in there, it clogs them up and whatnot. So a so little bank sitting around to, you know, to kind of replace components if needed, when needed. And uh, yeah. I wish I would have just uh, invested in better caging from the get-go. You know, I, I used some of those uh, wooden cement tub racks for a while. Right, right. I was always dealing with rodents chewing out and whatnot. So, so eventually I hit the bullet, invested in some Freedom Breeder and ARS racks, and, you know, I, I wish I would have done that a long time ago. Yeah, dude, honestly, I'm still running the old cement racks over here for the small amount of rodents that we do breed. Um, but, yeah, no, especially with, like, ASFs in the past, those things seem to chew out of pretty much anything that you put them those around. Those things are savage yeah, little yeah. creatures. They man. are, man. They're I mean, crazy. Like, I, I love how fat they get They get your snakes, man, but they are definitely little savages. I want to talk a little bit about the Celtic gene. So the Celtic gene is one of these genes that have, you know, really increased in popularity during the last couple of years, despite being around since, like, 2009. So... Originally, this was seen as a new line of arabesque out in Europe, um, but really, we've now seen that this uh, gene has been able to stand on its own due to its great contrast. While rising in popularity in the hobby, it still is one of these genes that not much has been done with it. So Brad, talk to me a little bit about some of the project highlights that you're working with the Celtic gene, maybe some of the potential that you're seeing into it. So I haven't produced a ton with Celtic gene yet, you know, but between the, the litter Chaz made this year, the litter I made, you know, it definitely opened my eyes to the potential of the gene, you know. I just bred a regular old uh, Celtic het call to a, yeah. to a nice uh, cherry uh, pastel hypojungle het call female. You know, I made a few hypojungle Celtics, uh, sunglow jungle Celtics, and uh, man, they, they definitely exceeded my expectations. You know, they have that nice connected pattern, super vibrant colors, you know, it's... Um, I hate to admit it, but I, I think it's a superior to uh, the Kiwi in Roswell and uh, yeah. the reason I say that is when you start mixing in other genes like say hypo and jungle like say in a Key West sometimes like a hypo Key West is really yeah. hard to identify it, it, some people think it's just a regular hypo but but the Celtic just keeps that pattern together um, the female I bred actually she turned out to be a super hypo so everything wow. was hypo but every single Celtic had that strong interconnected pattern you know just incredible color and you know I, I'm, I'm really, really excited to keep building upon that you know eventually add in some Key West also on top of that Celtic in those sun glows and uh, you know, I'll do the VPI thing too. Chaz is kind of working that side, but uh, you know, yeah, definitely a lot of untapped potential in the gene. I would say that's the main thing that I notice is their connected pattern. When I, I, fr I first got like a trio of Celtics from um, Richard Field and uh, I was just amazed like they are a little more speckly, a little darker animals, but I was always amazed with like how connected their patterns are, especially their tails and their tails are super super red so um i first did a breeding in 2015 when i bred a um a key west het tea to a celtic and i made all these key west celtics and they looked like the craziest um super they were almost like supers they were yeah they but they were cleaner than like super key west that i've ever seen and i immediately was like oh i'm on to something like this is uh this is good and even the regular key celtics i made in that litter they were far better than the key west they're their patterns more connected the things that the, the hallmarks of why you like the gene are you know the the connected pattern obviously and and, and the, the color and celtics have a really really rich like golden undertone they're a little bit more speckled than key west or cleaner but right. but like i said they their color palette is just it's a little different they're they're more golden they have more pinks they're, and they're they're overall a darker animal so this year i actually bred a um I ended up breeding, I ran a couple different mills, but I ended up bringing a snow, uh, VPI snow jungle Key West um, to a Celtic that I thought was head tea. She was 50%. She didn't prove out. But yeah. the, the Celtic Key West jungles that I made in there are incredible. They're, uh, they're, they have a real specific pattern. Um, it's fully connected. Um, they're a much darker animal. And then their eyes are even darker than your standard. Like a Key West, everyone knows, or hopefully everyone knows that Key West have you know, dark stone ground eyes and the right. faded mustache, but what the, that extra dose of Celtic on top just completely kind of changed the look of the animal. So, um, it's a gene that I think has a great, all the, all the, all the, you know, potential in the world, like Brad said, because my main thing that, that I think people, the main detractor with Key West is that when you breed help Celt or when you breed hypo into it, the Key West, um, you know, it can be very, very hard to tell. And then you start oh, yeah, layering some of these other genes on it and i think to your standard or to your new your newer um person in the hobby they they kind of lose the key they kind of lose what the essence of the key west is but that is not the case with celtic at all that the 
the the pattern always um, shines through. It's it's a very unique animal, and I think it. I think, like Brad said, I, personally, I do like it even better in the Key West. And I think that as time goes on, people will see the actual value in it, and it's something that you can go and get super cheap if you can even find a breeder that's making them in the U.S. You know, it's a very it's much more based in Europe. So. Um, you know, I just think the sky's the limit with that. And Brad, Brad proved it. Because if you saw, I know he's posted a couple of them, but I don't know how many people have seen it. His Sun Glow Jungle Key West um, that he made are outstanding. Like yeah. some of the best calls I've ever seen. Yeah, and that's the, the first yeah. generation. That's yep. the first breeding. You know, it's the very first breeding. So um, sky's the limit. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and it's one of these projects that has really been tied heavily to sharp to the sharp complex up to this yeah. point, right? It seems like most of the key, most of the Celtic stuff that you see out there is het sharp or is sharp um, or possible het sharp, but really, it, very little has been done on the call side. I know with when Brad uh, did his uh, Sunglo Celtic stuff, that was only maybe like the third, you know, really good, you know. Celtic call kind of breeding, so I think that that yeah. side of the project is totally in its infancy. You know what yeah. I mean? And and same with VPI, you don't see very many people mixing anything, mixing any Celtic into VPI. Yeah, yeah. To no no, I mean it's just something that hasn't been done. And hell, I even still have a lot of friends. When I made this litter, I, I showed people, and they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, it's no, I don't, I don't take it personal because like i said everyone has different flavors and what floats their boat but yeah you know if we take a look me and brad have been fortunate enough we've made some key west vpi stuff and some snow glow key west stuff and i show people like okay so look at the snow glow key west and look at this jungle key west that i made that's a snow look how good this is this is an amazing snake has a really really just specific type of pattern and color palette but imagine layering celtic on top of that you know when you talk about the orange jasmine bloodlines like a lot of Frank Martin Snows and stuff, and um, Kyle Frost for that matter, they have like blue tails. Like they're right. lavender when they're born and as they mature, they turn into like ice blue. Like yep. imagine if we can get an even darker, redder tail on top of that, like with a better pattern. Like you have to think like, what's that gonna do? And it's something that's readily available. Like a morph that you can work with that makes everything better for three, four, five hundred dollars Like it seems like a no brainer to me, but you know, a lot, a lot of times I've noticed people in the bowl world now they want to see the proof they want to see the proof of the proof in the pudding so it's just yeah. on the backs of me and brad and other people to kind of prove it to him like look this is a good project this 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 can bring you know value to anything that you're doing but unfortunately you just have to show them more or less the end product before i think people really fully jump in and buy into all that stuff yeah and i think you're touching on a really important subject and that's the fact that very few people uh, despite what they might tell themselves, want to be uh, trendsetters, right? A lot of yeah. people just basically want to select a project that's already proven to produce nice animals, and essentially they either want to produce a nice animals because they might not have the financial resources to get into those nice animals right off the bat, right? Yeah. Or simply because they're looking to flip their money around as quickly as possible, right? Yeah. The reality is, in order to be successful, and if you look at any breeder, whether it's uh, ball pythons, boas, or really, you know, retics, whatever it might be, the people that truly have long-lasting success are those that are willing to go out on the limb and work yeah. a project out that maybe hasn't really been touched a lot in the past, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to touch on it again, but I look at, like, a lot of the success that ball, py ball python people have, and it's tanking, like, genes like yellow belly, like... Yellow belly on its own is like, it's almost an indistinguishable morph. Like it's, or red stripe. The first time I saw a red stripe, I was like, are you, you serious? That's, that's a red stripe? And people were telling me, yeah, this is, this is a red stripe. But yeah, you take, you add that to a clown or you add spot nose to a clown, yellow belly, spot nose, yellow belly clown or chocolate or all these other very, very subtle genes. And it's like an amazing result. But yet boa people are the first people to turn their, turn their noses up at something that's an enhancing gene like key west it, it enhances yep. everything it touches whether yep. it's aztec whether it's jungle whether it's motley it makes a much better snake but people are like nah i'm good you know yep. but like when, when are we going to get the people that actually see the and i can tell you about a million other genes marin is marin is another one of them i used yep. to exclusively work with marins and i couldn't save them to sell my life because people don't want to waste the time 
that it actually takes to slightly enhance something 10%. Like, that's another thing that Justin Kabulka says. He says, I'll spend the money and the time to enhance something, even if it's only by 10%, because it'll be worth it in the end, because it'll be distinguishable. But with the problem with bows is that there's a little bit more variation, and people, and it takes more time, a little bit more variation in the standard morph, meaning that you take jungle, you'll get some great jungles in a litter and some average looking jungles. But with ball pythons, it's pretty straight across the board, straight straight look that you have standard look for a morph. Yeah. But with boas, people aren't willing to spend that time to make that extra 10% on the higher end of an amazing holdback, high quality animal. They're like, well, this animal's pretty good and I'm just gonna stick with that. So you, you're right, people don't wanna, because it does take time and effort and money, but um, it just makes me kind of scratch my head. And like I talked about before, that's why I like Brett because he, he's taking the time to do, to tinker with these things on the lower end and it's proving it's proving out to be worth it on the back end yeah no exactly man and i think at the end of the day caltech is just one of these genes that has been around for a really long time and people just simply have ignored it you know what i mean yeah. and the reality is because they have it opens up you know a potential for maybe somebody who's newer in the boa industry that really wants to make an impression you know sooner rather than later to like get in on genes like this and really try to explore those genes and the possible interactions of those genes like Brad is doing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Brad, if I was talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no worries, you're good. But, but look at that, that Orangasm uh, VPI Snuggle Key West I made this year. Some yeah. people will look at that animal, it's an incredible looking animal, but some people won't even recognize the Key West in there. But if yeah, we we're yeah. able to make the Celtic version of that, there would be no mistaking that. Everybody from your entry level person to the, the most expertise person, they, they would recognize there is Celtic in that animal, you know? Yeah. And a lot of people talking about how we're gonna bring back pattern to like the Sterlings or Scorias. You know what, if any gene's gonna do it, my bet is on Celtic to start bringing yeah. some pattern back into those kind of morphs. So, and uh, who knows what a Celtic labyrinth will look like, you know? That, that'll probably exactly. just be the most incredibly yeah. patterned snake, so. There's so much to be done with it. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of interactions that I'm really curious on. Like, you mentioned one, but it's like, imagine now, like, Celtic, Motley, and Labyrinth coming together. Like, what is yeah. that potentially going to end up doing? Or maybe even, like, throwing in, like, a nice jungle line in there. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, how is that going to interact with each other? That's going to be absolutely nutty, dude. Once somebody has the, the presence of mind to be able to chase, you know, projects such as those. Um, so, Brad, any uh, other major plans that you kind of have for Celtic coming up? Um, kind of how we touched on before, just, just looking to build upon those Sunglow Jungles, um, add in Key West, other, other Roswell, you know, maybe Roswell, Key West, more pattern enhancing genes, uh, eventually get some IMG in there, um, and I get some better pastel lines as well. Um, I know me and Chad's been talking about it for a while. Uh, we want to get the red rum into the call stuff. Right. So I, I think in the whole, uh, with the Celtics getting red rum in there would would definitely be the next step. It's something I failed at last year, but hopefully this year I can make it happen. But I mean, there's some incredible examples of call out there nowadays. Like it's just in absolutely incredible, whether it's lipstick or whether it's whatever, whatever you want to put into. But I think you, you look at some, how incredible some of these red rum VPIs like Richard, Richard's making and Thomas is making like, I actually think they might even be better in, in a call form, so you just gotta, you just gotta do it. It's something I've been wanting to do for a while, so hopefully we can break through this year. Yeah, no, definitely. So guys, uh, talk to me a little bit why you guys feel that kind of the Celtic gene is poised to make kind of a, uh, uh, a new run at the hobby and why it might be one of the key projects in the future. So, so I don't think the gene is for everybody. A lot of people prefer like a, a reduced pattern boa. But for the people that are the fan of the heavily pattern, you know, super aberrant kind of animals, you know, th this is going to be a key ingredient to, to make any of those, those kind of combinations, you know. That's really where I see it going. And uh, with the heavier pattern, once you get, you know, like the snow glow version of it, it's, it's right. the contrast is just going to be so much better. And, uh, you know, the end result will be well worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I see, I see a, a few litters nowadays where, they're amazing litters, but um, I'm not even going to touch on the specific genes, but it seems like a, a, a lot of times the pattern is being diminished by some of the newer, by some of the stuff. And I think it's almost like, um, 
you know, it, it, it's, it honestly just comes down to what people like. I, I prefer more heavily patterned, more aberrant, and that's why I think a lot of people tend to lean towards labyrinth because it, it's such a variable, heavy pattern, also like a jungle. But um, I think we have to be really careful when you mix a lot of this stuff and it kind of just goes away. Like, I, people, the, one of the people's favorite things is, is pattern. And um, yeah. if you can find an easy way to get it back on there, especially with added color, um, yeah, exactly what Brad said. It's be nothing but sky's the limit. Awesome. All right, guys. So we're going to take a break real quick, and when we come back, we're going to do the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen. All right, guys. We're back, and it's time for the Dirty Dozen. Brad, I'm going to ask you 12 questions. Give me 12 answers. All right. Number one, what's the size of your current collection? Ooh. Uh, don't tell my wife but uh, it's probably around 150 or so right now <laughs> all right man and then uh out of that 150 uh what's kind of boas what's ball pythons right there i would say it's probably about 120 boas 30 ball python right cool. in that area cool all right man uh number two husbandry question frozen thought or life and what's your betting choice Ooh. so so I would say neither. I, I go with pre-killed. I'd say about yep. 99% of my animals I'll feed pre-killed. You know, yep. certain babies, I'll start them on live. Um, I like doing pre-killed. I don't want my snakes getting bit. I don't want them getting loose in my snake room. So, you know, pre-killed is the way to go. Um, even all my ball python readily take pre-killed. So um, as far as bedding, um, I was using aspen for a lot of a lot of years. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, I've had trouble getting a, a good source of aspen. So I, I've been using Pro Coco recently. Okay. And uh, for all my babies and sub-adults, and, you know, I'm really liking it so far. And then for the adults, I use that corrugated cardboard. You just order a big roll from Uline. You know, it's real simple. Cut to size. Yeah, totally. Uh, number three, what's your favorite morph or locality? That's got to be the labyrinth. You know, it's just just a single gene labyrinth. It just, I don't know. They're, they're breathtaking. They're so incredible. And they, there's still a ton to be done with them. It's, it's definitely an exciting gene to be part of. Nice, man. All right. What is the most overrated morph to you? This, this is tough because I really like this gene, but I think it's kind of like an end game, you know, like the single gene is about as best you can do with it. So yeah, that would be the scoria, you know. Um, they're incredible animals, but I don't really know what you do to kind of improve upon that. You know, you can change the color. You know, hopefully we can bring some pattern back to them. But, uh, you know, they're incredible animals, but... You know, at the price tag they're currently at, I, I'd rather just go buy another labyrinth. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I stand. Cool. Uh, what's the most underrated morph? So we, we've talked about it a lot today. That I would say the Celtic. Um, it's still relatively unknown here in the U.S. Um, still a lot to be done with it. Um, it's up to personal preference, though, like I said. If, if you like a heavily patterned snake, you know, Celtics are where it's at as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. All right, man. What's your favorite part of the hobby? So I, I would say seeing projects you've worked on for years finally come to fruition. You know, say in a project that, you know, you breed those back, eventually you, you make that end goal kind of animal, you know. There, there's nothing better than walking into your, your snake room and seeing a big pile of baby boa, you know, all that hard work kind of finally come to fruition. Nice, man. All right, what's your the worst part of the hobby to you? Well, for me, I, I would say it's cleaning rodents, you know. Like I said, <laughs> every Saturday morning I got to dedicate three, four hours Every yeah. single weekend, you know, to get out there first thing in the morning, clean them up. It's it's not fun. It it stinks. It's it's gross. It's messy. But uh, you know, like I said, it, it's kind of a necessary evil in my mind to kind of maximize you know my success. Yeah. All right, number eight, man. And you kind of already touched on this. With what other species do you keep and why? So yeah, we kind of touched on the ball pythons. You know, probably just because I've been in. You know, in the ball python since I was a kid. You know, I've been keeping them since I was like 11 or 12. They have a lot of really cool morphs. There's, you know, even there's been a ton of stuff done with my ready, but there's still some some uncharted waters we can navigate and make a new combination. So, so that's kind of fun. They're not the most interesting species, but the morphs are really cool. And uh, I also have a California king snake just because that was the first kind of snake I had. You know, yeah. just to kind of you know remind me of where I came from. And I, I still think the colubrids are cool. I just don't really want to to breed them on a larger scale yeah i feel you man honestly i've actually found myself kind of coming back to some colubrids in the last couple of years mostly because like my youngest daughter is really into colubrids 
So she's got, you know, a couple nice, of Hondurans, nice. and she's got a couple of Mountain King snakes, and she's she recently, like, for, you know, her birthday, which was a couple of weeks ago, we got her uh, a Grey Band King snake, so she's all over the, all nice, over those little nice. guys. But they're, yeah, they're, they're dope. the cool colubrid morphs out there. Yeah, man, for sure. All right, number nine, what's a common misconception about you? Ooh. So I don't, I don't think I'm really well known enough, well known to really having misconceptions. So I'm, I'm kind of, I've, the way I look at it, I'm kind of a nobody in the hobby. So, you know, I really don't know. Maybe, maybe you would know better. I don't know, man. I think you're too humble for your own good. I think that's probably one of, one of the, the main things. How, what, what do you think, Chaz? Um, I don't know. I, I honestly, I wouldn't, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about Brad exactly, and he has yeah. great customer service and he's just a likable guy that works really hard and I think that's really respectable in this hobby so um, I don't know it might be it stumps me but um, I think the one thing is about Brad is most people don't know is you'd be uh, really amazed like um, the animals he's able to make and even his rodent production room about the size of actually what it is and yep. how much he maximizes it I think that's the main thing to take away is that like a lot of people want to get into snakes and say well I don't have the space or they make excuses but the and Brad can touch on it, and he can talk about it if you want. But he makes a lot of good snakes in a very, very small amount of space. Yes, and then does. his yep. his rodent room is extremely well insulated. He runs air filters and and all this humidifiers and and all this other stuff. And he makes great rodents in a very, very tiny space. And it can be done. It's just it's just like 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 um, what he talked about. You have to get out there and do the work all the time. You have to be willing to make the sacrifices and be consistently go out there and work. And it's not always fun, but my thing is that he just, he does, he makes chicken salad out of chicken, you know, you know the saying, you know what I'm getting at, but he yeah, makes, yeah. he makes a lot out of a little and he, he's been doing it for years. And um, I think that's my, my favorite thing about him is how hard he works and um, just the type of person he is. Yeah, dude, I, I think that's, re you're really nailing it. Like, not to pump them up anymore, man, but I think one of the general things that you get from everybody that's ever dealt with Brad, uh, you know, the guy treats you like your family, you know, he always is out to try to help you out any way that he can, and then the animals he produces are just top-notch, man, and I think a lot of times he's very uh, humble about it, but really, like, I consider him one of the top breeders on the West Coast, even though not a lot of people really, you know, might know his name. It seems like the people that really do know his names are all mm -hmm. the people that everybody else considers the top breeders, right? Yeah. And, like, it's one of those things that if you're talking to guys that have been in the boa game for a really long time, and you mention Brad's name, they're like, oh, yeah, I love that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas the only people that really seem to not know him very well are the people that are fairly new to the hobby, right? I think yeah. that's really the where he might be a little bit unknown. So hopefully, like, this podcast goes out and makes more people aware of him and, you know, the quality of his animals. Yep. All right, man. Um <laughs> Number 10, dude, what makes you say, what was I thinking when you look back at your time at the hobby? Yes, so that had to have been when I was around 16 or so, you know, I got, I ended up being more interested in cars, girls, stuff like that, so I, I sold off my state collection, you know. Yeah. Um, I really, looking back, I really regret that, you know, I could have been so much further along in a lot of the projects, you know, I, I'm working with, but if I didn't really, you know, hit that reset button back then. Yeah, no, totally, man. I think uh, a lot of us have done it for diff different reasons, kind of. You know, life, it gets to you when it comes to that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man, number 11, what's one tip you would give people looking to invest in boas and reptiles? So we've kind of touched on a little bit before, but I'd say to pursue projects that are a little less mainstream, maybe outside of the box, you know? You know, in the bow world, it's a little harder to do because uh, we're more limited on, on the amount of morphs out there. You know, not like the ball world, but like we said, what JKR has taken these morphs that nobody cares about. You know, he's plugged them into certain other combinations, made incredible animals, and, and now, you know, prices are going through the roof. People can't get enough of them. So, so if, if I were new in the industry, that's what I would be focusing on, just, you know, trying to make something different, you know, not yeah. the same old stuff everybody's producing. Totally, man. All right, man, number 12, final one. Any shout-outs you want to give out? Yeah, so shout-out to my wife. You know, she's been really supportive, you know, on this whole, my, all my endeavors. She's always there, always has my back, you know. Uh, shout-out to my parents, uh, putting up my reptile obsession as a kid. You know, at one point I had, like, 20 snakes in their living room, you know, set up on <laughs> bookshelves and, and little Rubbermaid tubs, you know. But uh, um, also shout-out to Steve and David over at Sun Devil Reptiles and uh, Makayat Moss Rep. 
Um, we'll be vending the uh, Phoenix show here coming up November 21st. Okay. Nice, man. You know, come out and see us there. Um, shout out to the Arizona Boa Breeders Group on Facebook. You know, we, we're building a nice little uh, community here in Arizona. A lot of cool people. So uh, anybody that's local, you know, definitely, definitely join the group. You know, we'll, we'd love to have you. Just a, just a good group of people out there. Absolutely, man. All right, guys. Well, that wraps it up for today. Uh, Brad and Chaz, tell the people out there where they can see your animals and learn more about you. So uh, you can uh, find me on Instagram at uh, b.sherman underscore reptiles. Um, I also have animals listed on uh, Morph Market, Brad Sherman Reptiles. I'm on Facebook also. Um, use that a little bit, just a personal account, you know, under Brad Sherman. Uh, my avatar is a picture of Alf. Because yep. uh, people kind of say I resemble him slightly. So. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I said, come check us out, Phoenix Rep Reptile Expo, November 21st, 22nd. We'll be bringing out all sorts of cool boas. So uh, look forward to seeing you. Awesome, man. Chaz. You can, you can just find me on Morph Market. All my uh, contact information's on there at Loki Boas and uh, what few animals I have for sale are up there. So check them out. Yeah, and then with me, guys, you can find us as, as uh, Morphs underscore Unleashed on Morph Market. And, uh, yeah, what few animals we have are up there. Uh, so, guys, thanks for listening. We are out. Guys, that was a great episode. Thanks to Brad Sherman of Brad Sherman Reptiles for joining us today. I want to send a quick shout out to all you guys listening, and I wanted to thank you for all the support that you guys have given the show. The whole Boy Rack Radio team, including Sergio, Thomas, Chaz, and I, thank you guys. We're going to do our best to keep putting out awesome boa content for you guys to enjoy, and we have a bunch of cool shows lined up, and we hope that you guys tune in. Join us on our next episode as we speak with Matt Cook and Thomas Cobb. We're going to talk about identifying and dealing with infectious diseases in your boa collection. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Do us a favor. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. Until next time, grow them slow.